We stepped into the 2000s, we entered the Web 2.0 era. We not just consumed content online, but also created and shared it across various platforms. And with increasing decentralized power in the hands of users, we've since entered into a new era of the information age, the Web 3.0 or the semantic age. Now, artificial intelligence, uh, which was referred to by the previous speaker, is emerging as one of the fundamental building blocks of Web 3.0, promising to improve the user experience through relevant content recommendations and improved human-machine interactions. And since Web 3.0 envisions a digital realm where machines can communicate directly with other machines and users, it's a given that we're looking at a system where deep learning algorithms will train artificial intelligence to recognize different types of content and attribute meaning to them. So what does all of this mean for us as users? Now in India, the Web 3.0 movement is in its nascence as we are still exploring its sustainability and scalability. And lucky for us all, we have with us the world's leading authorities on this topic to help with our explorations to speak to us on how can India race to the artificial intelligence future and Web 3.0. Please welcome on stage the president of NASCOM, Devjani Ghosh, and the MD and CEO of Tech Mahindra, CP Gurnani. They will be in conversation with national editor of ET Now, Aisha Faridi. Round of applause. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You know, uh, Bikram actually set the stage for our discussion. What is AI? So we'll try and understand over the next 15 minutes, what is AI? How does it impact you and me? I have with me two esteemed panelists here, like my co-host Madhav was just describing, um, who perhaps know best what is AI. Dibjani, if I could start with you, you know, um, Iron Man in Hollywood movies has always had Jarvis. Shah Rukh Khan had uh, Ravan, and then he created his own version to try and beat Ravan. That is also AI. Chat GPT, which we're hearing time and again now, and some of us have used, that is also AI. What is AI? How, how much of it is already reality, and how much of it is fantasy? So, okay. Um, so AI can stand for many things, right? I mean, the official definition of AI is artificial intelligence. Um, I believe AI stands for what we want it to stand for, and it should stand for what we want it to stand for. And what I want it to stand for is augmented intelligence. It's something that augments human intelligence. It's something that will augment human productivity, human creativity. And I think it's very important for us humans to realize that we have to take control in this game. We don't have the option, while there is a lot of concern, et cetera, about AI taking over, I think we still have the option to decide who is in the driver's seat, who is going to control how this technology plays out. And if we do take that control back, I think it's very important for us to develop the technology like every technology as a tool to help human productivity. So the magic is not the technology. The magic is the human users who uses the technology to create great stuff, to you know, find a cure for cancer, to solve climate crisis, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Mr. Gurnani, that of course is the bookish definition of it, but practically and personally, how does one use AI to try and enhance your lives on a daily day? I think uh, everybody in this room will remember the word application when we started writing letters and the dictionary was inbuilt yeah. <laughs> sometimes the grammar was inbuilt sometimes the sentences were inbuilt now if you recall artificial intelligence that was for most of us the first exposure mm. now fast forward you just had uh, Vikram talk about you know artworks being created, 
Fast forward, I still remember 2019 when a colleague of mine, Bindra, wrote a book called Tech Whisperers. And he writes a fair amount of columns on ET now, or oh, sorry, on ET, uh, about artificial intelligence. In 2019, he, he wrote a book called Tech Whisperers, and one of the chapters was in blue. And why it was in blue? Because it was written by artificial intelligence. So to me, that word document to a chapter being written was still a linear progression. Now we are talking about exponential progression where if Picasso was alive, he would wonder whether it is his painting or somebody else's painting. But Devjani, the great, you know, latest keyword is AI or BARD or, you know, chat GPT, generative AI. Everyone's talking about it. No one really knows what it could lead to. At what stage of development when it comes to AI are we currently at? And what next could be the future of it all? Um, so, so, yes, chat GPT happened and it sort of changed all our Today perception. We are powered by Google, so it is barred. Bard. No, no, I'm saying ChatGPT was the first one to come out, Bard. Uh, Bard came after that. So ChatGPT came out in November, uh, though Google wrote the Transformer paper way back in 2017, which was the underlying architect of, uh, of the technology. But what was that moment when ChatGPT came out? Why was that such a big moment? So here are some numbers for you, right? When ChatGPT came out, it reached 100 million users in two weeks, two weeks. Any idea how long it took, say the, you know, the most popular app you can think of, like Instagram? Two and a half months. Twitter, two years. Netflix, to get to 100 million users, 3.5 years. So all of a sudden with ChatGPT, the scale of adoption was, was just completely mind blowing. Why did that happen? Because what happened with ChatGPT was AI became English. You didn't have to be a coder. You didn't have to know Python. You didn't have to know C++ or whatever other language is there. If you knew English, you could interact and you could use the AI tools to get poems written. How many of you have written poems about something or the other using ChatGPT? I think all of us have. You could get poems written, you could get <laughs> recipes out, you could get uh, summaries of articles that you have read, you could get write out letters, etc., etc. right? And, and all of a sudden, AI stopped being the domain of, say, the coders and the data scientists, and it became the domain pretty much for the entire English-speaking population of the world. And now it's becoming the domain of Hindi-speaking and multi multiple languages because uh, there's been a lot of follow-up and a lot of the other models are coming out in multi uh, different languages. So that was the magic where the democratization of technology, and you're talking about using AI. How many people in this room use Amazon or Netflix? I think all of us. All of you? Much. You are using AI. When it gives you those recommendations that this is what you should buy or this is the movie it sh you should watch, that's AI at work. So AI, by the way, India has one of the largest users of AI. We may not be developing a lot of it, but we are using it. We are consuming it. We are one of the largest users of AI. So it's in our lives. It's just getting democratized now so that we are not just, you know, using it unknowingly, but we can use it as a tool to create new things. So, yeah, that's, that's where the magic of AI is. And, and generative AI, very simply, I'll give an example of traditional AI and generative AI, since there's a lot of talk about generative AI. Imagine traditional AI, imagine a bowl of fruits, if you teach the model, it will be able to pick an apple, an orange, and identify them, right? Generative AI is not only can it pick, but if you tell it, I would like to see a fruit that is purple and triangular, it will create a new one. So the ability to create new content is what has now got added in a very simplistic way. <laughs>
But Mr. Gunani, for something so fabulous, which can create something out of your imagination, you wouldn't need human beings eventually, right? I mean, the good news of, you know, the working around us today, you know, since we had Google present a little bit uh, ahead of us, you know what was going through my mind? Was that we have Google Maps. We all use Google Maps and it's a definitive example of what I call human intelligence and augmented intelligence. And the same Google guys have been running a program for the automated car or the driverless car. Yeah. Now, still away from the reality. So now what is the point I'm trying to make out here is we will reach that stage of Google Maps, but to become a driverless, it will take a long more time. And number two, in my opinion, artificial intelligence will actually expand the marketplace. It's coincidental that, uh, you know, the Honorable Minister Piyush Goyal is in the, fly, uh, uh, in the audience right now. I still remember three years ago, I happened to be on the same flight with him. He caught hold of me and asked me two questions. How do we make artificial intelligence a tool for everybody? Now, before I could answer, I don't know whether Honorable Goyal will remember, but he said every department should have a target of having five use cases in artificial intelligence. The second part, I, I was just narrating sir, that story of that airline when you to asked me, every department should have five use cases in artificial intelligence. The second ask was convert some of our academic institutes into universities for AI. Hmm. So my point is that there is a desire to make India leapfrog. Yeah. India has an opportunity to leapfrog. And in my opinion, as the market expands, I think we should be ready to take advantage. While some industries will sunset, but the new industries would be born. Deepjani, uh, you know, before we wrap up, India has always been the cloud kitchen for the world IT needs, right? We've been known for our cheap labor, we've been known for our coding, we've been known as the back-end office for the IT services need of the world. Um, doesn't AI then make humans redundant? And wouldn't that sort of take away from India's prowess as an IT services leading nation? Uh, first of all, I completely disagree with okay. that statement. Okay. India used to be known as the back-end office for the tech world long back, long, long back. The world has completely changed. Today, if you think of any company, think of Mercedes-Benz, think of Boeing, think of any company, any world-class company, the innovation for that company is happening in India. Today, the I in innovation for the world is India. So I think that has completely changed. And yes, with these new technologies, we are just going to get better and better. Right, Mr. Gunani, you want to add something here? You know, from my point of view, I think Devjani has made the point that on the value curve, we have proven and established ourselves. I think the next step has to be, are we the net importer of technology? or are we the net exporter of technology? It's no longer about, I'm not discussing, uh, you know, process. I'm now talking about a product. I'm talking about creating the next $1 trillion, uh, you know, company out of India. So I think this is a clearly an opportunity for all of us. The reason it is an opportunity is that if you go back into some of the basic questions is what skills are required for AI? To me, the basic skills are the same that we have all learned, which is the fundamentals of physics, science, chemistry, maths, the fundamentals of, you know, uh, uh, any kind of a programming, fundamentals of science combined with the, the domain knowledge, and the more we are able to marry, if we are going to be the fastest growing economy, it only means is that we are going to use the tools. And if we are going to use the tools, which is AI, I mean, then we should be ahead of anyone else. 
Great. So you're agreeing that we can't be replaced by AI, right? On that note, thank you so much, both of you, for taking time out and uh, you know giving a slice to our viewers as to what really AI means and what could it entail in the future. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you to.